open up your eyes see the beauty around you and open up your ears and hear nature calling you and open up your heart and feel the love he has for you and open up your hand and give to the one who and welcome, everybody. I am Rabbi Shlomo Nachman ben Yaakov, and this is What Now? with Donald Willinger and my humble self. Glad that you're with us today. We're going to have a really cool program today. We have a special guest named Panina Taylor. I'm not going to tell you too much about Panina because Panina is going to begin by sharing, uh, by sharing her story, and you're going to be amazed, I do believe. I don't want to trump this up too much because then you're you know you always want to start with low expectations but i think that no i think that no matter how high your expectations are this time you're going to be very pleased as you get to know panina uh, i met panina because donald our dear friend donald told me about panina quite a while ago so i watched several of her videos and i just thought i would love to do an interview with her and uh, so first, I'm going to let Donald come on and share a little bit about uh, about about uh, his relationship with, or his friendship with with Panina very briefly, and then we'll get started with the interview. Donald, thank you for introducing us. Shalom, 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 everyone, and welcome, Panina. It is wonderful to see you, as it is, Rabbi. Good to see you too. Panina and I met many years ago on another chat program. And I think the highlight of my time was when I had a little bit of a, an issue over something being said in a room. And I called Panina. It was 2, 3 in the morning. I woke her up from a sound sleep. She's never forgiven me, probably. And she dealt with it. She is an absolutely wonderful, very extremely knowledgeable woman that speaks all over the world, literally. She is invited to speak all over the world. Now, I'm back to you, Rabbi. All right, thank you, Donald. Um, on the chat screen, I can s just barely see the top name, Gertz, and I can't see your last name. I'm sorry, I can't see that. David Berman has joined us. Patty W. Smith is here. Guy Bratowski has joined us. Don Glasser is here. Ah, here we go. Gertz uh, Rubeb, God bless you. Thank you, Gertz. Glad that you're here. Uh, Guy says shalom to everybody. Donald says shalom. David Brown is here. Scotty Helton is here. Moisha Schwartz is here. Timothy Walker, my childhood friend from a million years ago, back in the dinosaur age, is here. Hi, Tim. Glad you're here. Peter Bosch is joining us. Ricardo Ivan Calderon is here. Joseph Baum is here. A Bean, I'm sorry, Baim is here. Ronald Newman is here. Carolyn Oshpelt. Benina Taylor is here, obviously. And Mark Metzer is here. Carolyn Oshpelt says shalom to everybody. Susan Randalls is here. And David says shalom to everybody, and I'm sure we'll be joined by more people as time goes on. Glad you're all here. So, having said that, Panina, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, probably, I was looking over your friends list. We have quite a few friends in common. <laughs> so, a lot of people probably know who you are, but uh, some may not. So, if you would, just tell us a little bit about yourself. You want a little bit, or you want a lot? <laughs> well, let's start. Let's just do a lot over the whole thing, but let's start out with a little bit of basic stuff, and then we'll get deeper as we go. Oh, you want to do the roundabout way that takes about three hours? No, okay. Oh. Right, let me let me rephrase this. Let me rephrase this. <laughs> Panina, I didn't say anything yet. Hi, tell me about yourself. <laughs> I would like right, well, to know I'll... more about your background story and how you became the person that you are today, and then we can look more sure. detailed at what your specialty is. My pleasure. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I always uh, enjoy, I, I had been doing for a while my own program. I called it Unorthodoxed. And um, Ooh, I like that. And I uh, was interviewing people and I had to stop because I had some health issues. But I know how it can be hard sometimes to get people, especially people who are really busy, to come on and do a program with you. So I feel like if I've got the time, that I'd like to do that. And also to be able to connect with people live, basically, or almost live, who perhaps are following me on Facebook or have a familiarity with me, and it gives me an opportunity to actually interact with them. So anyway, so I'm going to give you the nutshell version first, which is like, you know, oftentimes when I'm invited to someone's house for Shabbat, 
or especially when I'm on a speaking tour and Shabbat comes around and I'm eating at someone's house. And of course they say, you know, like, tell us your story. And I'm like, I just told my 45 minute story like 20 times this week. So I'll give you the nutshell version, but then um, I'm happy to go ahead and include more because what ends up happening in the long run is everybody has so many questions that we end up kind of doing this dance um, where it takes a lot longer than if I just went ahead and shared it with you. So the bottom line is, is that I was born Jewish uh, to a secular Jewish family. I had a difficult childhood. And um, when I was in high school, I ended up converting to Christianity. I married a pastor and the two of us ended up moving from Christianity to Messianic Judaism, where we started our own Messianic congregation along with my parents. We ran that for three years. Actually, my parents continued it for a while afterwards. And then we moved to the Orthodox Jewish community in Baltimore in order to convert Orthodox Jews into Messianic Jews. And God had the last laugh. And so here I am with you now. So that's the nutshell version of the story. That's that's wonderful. That's just that's taking a bunch of stuff and consolidating it really nicely. That was very good. Well, you know, the first time somebody said it's it's just like the first time when I was a Christian, I was a very, very brand new Christian. I was in 11th grade in high school and um, I was at summer camp and the um, camp counselor or the camp I guess, administrators or whatever had announced that they would love people to give their testimonies. And they said, but it has to be five minutes. And so I went to my counselor and I said to her, "Um, I have a a testimony to give, but I don't know how to give it in five minutes. And uh, I said, let me tell you the story and then you tell me how to do this in five minutes. And so I sat down and, and at that point, and we're talking about just the Christian part of my story, of my journey, um, you know, it took 45 minutes, I think, to tell her. And she was like, whoa. And they ended up giving, you know, every, every other camp, camp um, not student, but participant uh, was given five minutes. And I was given a half an hour to tell, to give my testimony. So, um, the same kind of thing happened when somebody said, okay, well, give me your five minute version of your story. And I'm like, there is no five minute version of my story. It takes me an hour. And I had to work really hard to get it down to below an hour so that I could do it as a presentation. Um, and it took a long time to figure out how to give it in just a few sentences. So there you go. That's years of culling and working on getting this good. as concise as possible. That was good. I could <laughs> I could never have done mine that quickly. That was very impressive. And I know well, that I, yours is just incredible. I think it's important. It's yeah. it because you know, like there are a lot of people, for example, who will write me on Facebook and and they want to tell me their story in order to see how I can help them connect with them, whatever. I mean, they just want to share with me, mm-hmm. but they write a book. Right. And um, I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't sit here and read a book. Can you tell me in just a few sentences your story? So I think it's really important for everybody. You know, so many people, I'm sure every single person who's watching right now has a story, even if they don't think they do, they have a story. That's right. one of the things that you know, going around the world has taught me is that everybody's got a story. Some of us tell it better than others, and and some are certainly more interesting than others. But you've got to learn how to summarize your story in just a few sentences, because sometimes that's all the time that you have to give over where you've been. And even though it means leaving out a lot of details, it's really important to learn how to do that. So I would challenge all of you, if you're somebody who frequently is asked to give your story over, sit down and try to write it out in five sentences or less, you know, just so that you can give that nutshell version of your story. Yeah, when we were talking the first time, that was, that, that I'm, I'm not asking who you, you know, about you, what you want to do the broadcast. And that's exactly what you said. You said, so tell me your story. I forgot, five sentences, I forgot how you said sentences. it. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot exactly how you said it, but I'm thinking, wow, okay, <laughs> that's tough. <laughs> and I, I think I still went a little bit longer. But, but you um, did a pretty good job. You did pretty, you gotta, <laughs> it makes you have to pick out the important part, and that's really important because sometimes that's all the time that you have to establish a connection with yeah. somebody. Okay, so. so so why did you leave Judaism, and okay. why did you come back? And that's going to encapsulate the whole hour probably so i give you the mic 
Okay. So, uh, you know, if you don't mind, I'll just go ahead and kind of go through the story. And, you know, it's funny because I'm sitting down. So I feel like we're all kind of sitting around chatting with each other. It's not a formal presentation, but because let's face it, I've got it memorized. It's easier to just go through the, it the way that I normally do. Mm -hmm. And um, I start by explaining to people that um, I was born into a secular Jewish home. What my Judaism meant to me is explained why I talked with my hands, as you guys have probably already noticed, yeah. why I have a big nose and why I like Chinese food. <laughs> and um, that's all that Judaism meant to me. And so I had really very little connection with my Jewishness. And I had quite a... Um, a traumatic childhood. My parents were divorced when I was four years old and I suffered a tremendous amount of abuse at the hands of a friend of the family. And by the time I got to high school, I was starting to ask a lot of existential questions. I was starting to ask, you know, what's the point of it all? I mean, if there's nothing bigger, greater, more meaningful than all this pain in life, then what's the point? Right. And so while I was starting to ask these questions, God just happened to, I don't believe in coincidence you know, right. but uh, a classmate of mine came up to me and she said, you know, Panina, there are answers to your questions. She said, what you need is to have a relationship with God. And I thought about it for a minute and I remembered, so I mentioned to you that I was raised in a secular home, but when I was in fourth and fifth grade, I did actually attend a Jewish day school for two years. Um, it was arranged by my maternal grandparents who were afraid that I was going to be raised knowing absolutely nothing about being Jewish. They were a little bit more uh, connected to Judaism than my maternal grandparents were. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but the problem is, is that nothing that I learned at the Jewish school stuck. And maybe some of your viewers who were raised in a Jewish home might be able to identify with this because I quickly learned that what happens at home stays at home and what happens at school stays at school. My first, I, my first day in school, I think it was, I learned about Shabbat and I came running home. Remember, I'm in fourth grade. I came running home really excited telling my mom about this thing called Shabbat. And what does my mother say to me? She says, don't tell me how to run my life. Wow. Well, a few weeks later, I'm in school and my friends are talking. It's a, it's a Monday and my friends are all talking about what they had done over the weekend. And I was really excited because, you know, I was being raised in a single parent home. We didn't have a lot of money. We didn't get to do a lot of things. But that particular weekend, my mom had taken my sister and I to a um, an amusement park. And so my friends were all sharing what they had done over the weekend. And I started sharing about how I'd been to this amusement park on Saturday. Now that tells you how new I was mm -hmm. to the Jewish stuff because I didn't even realize that this was gonna be a problem. But my teacher caught wind of what I said, pulled me out of the classroom and said, stop being so chutzpah dick. And I didn't even know what that meant. Um, it seemed kind of like, I don't know, whatever it is, maybe it's a contagious disease or something, but it's certainly something that I don't want mm -hmm. to be anyway. And so I quickly learned that what happens at home stays at home and what happens at school stays at school. So now here I am all of these years in the future and I'm, I'm my friend says that what I need is, is to have a relationship with God. And I thought, you know, that makes sense. I think the seeds that were planted when I was in elementary school there in the Jewish school, we're getting a little bit of watering. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, you know, that sounds right. And she said, so what you need is you need to believe in Jesus. And so at that point, at almost 16 years old, I was introduced to God and to Jesus because my classmate was a born again Christian. Mm -hmm. So my newfound faith gave me the strength to make all sorts of changes in my life, as many people who are watching can probably attest to. Um, if you believe something strongly, it gives you power to be able to make these changes. Of course, we are powerful because we're created B'Tselem Elohim in the image of God. And so that has nothing to do with this in particular, but I had a strong belief, and so I began to make changes in my life. I stopped doing drugs, which I was doing. I didn't mention I was drinking and doing drugs and, and hanging out with bad kids at school, and I stopped doing all of that, and I began to make all of these changes in my life, and my mom was watching 
as she saw all of these changes happening and she thought to herself, if something could have such a profound effect on my daughter's life, it must be the truth. And so when I began to share my newfound faith with my mom, she believed it based on what she had seen happen in my own life. And so I brought my mother and my sister both to Christianity. And uh, after high school, I went off to Bible college. I went to what was then called Miami Christian College. Now it's called Trinity University in Miami. And um, and while I was there, I got a certificate in something called Evangelism Explosion. And I also started to date the older brother of my best friend from high school. His name was Paul. And Paul and I started to kind of get serious. And I thought, you know, we're probably going to be talking marriage one day. And I really have always had this dream that my father would walk me down the aisle when I get married. Now, I didn't know my father. I hadn't seen him in 15 years. So, you know, from four to 19, except one time I saw him for a day or two when I was about 14, I think. But um, I didn't know my dad. And so, of course, there's no way he's going to walk me down the aisle if he doesn't know me. Right. And so um, I asked my mom if it would be OK for me to write a letter to my dad to ask him to come and visit us. And to my surprise, she said yes. And so I wrote a letter to my dad inviting him to come and get to know us. And to my surprise, my dad said yes. And so my dad came down for Christmas break to stay with us for a couple of weeks. And while he was there, he got to know my mom better and he started to fall in love with my mom again. And so he said to my mom, you know, I'm kind of I'm falling back in love with you. Will you remarry me? And my mom said, I'm falling back in love with you, too, but we've got a problem. I can't marry you. You're a secular Jew and I'm a born again Christian and that's not going to work. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got a cert I'm certified in evangelism. I know what to do here. Let me talk to him. So I got a Christian Bible and I started sharing with him. And uh, lo and behold, I brought him to church and my dad became a Christian as well. And so I had brought my mom and my dad both to Christianity and my mom and my dad both got remarried to each other. And then seven months later, my dad walked me down the aisle when I married Paul in the church. Now, Paul also had been to Bible college. He went to Moody Bible Institute. And um, but at the time that we got married, he was not working as a pastor and he ended up getting he was in he enlisted in the Air Force and we ended up getting stationed in England. And while we were in England one day, I was praying and I suddenly got the feeling that God was telling me to start lighting candles on Friday night. And I wasn't sure exactly where that was coming from. And I, I certainly had no example of anybody in my family lighting candles. My mother didn't light candles on Friday night. My grandmother didn't. My great grandmother probably did, but I don't remember having seen it. But I had been to the Jewish school. And so I certainly knew that Jewish women lit candles on Friday night. Mm -hmm. And so I went to my husband and I said to him, you know, I have this feeling that God is telling me to light candles on Friday night. What do you think I should do? And my husband says to me, well, if you feel that this is what God wants you to do in your service to him, go ahead. So I said, OK, well, I happen to have my great grandmother's candlesticks. So I went and I opened the drawer and I pulled out her candlesticks. And uh, next to the candlesticks was a Maxwell House Passover Haggadah. Excuse me. And so. Um, I pulled out this Passover Haggadah and I opened it to the first page because inside the first page of the Haggadah is the blessing for lighting candles on Friday. Well, the blessing for lighting candles because Jewish women light candles at the beginning of every holiday, not just Shabbat, right. but also Shabbat. Right. And at the bottom, it had the line for including on Friday night because sometimes Passover begins on Friday night. Mm -hmm. And so with the use of this Maxwell House Haggadah, which happened to be 
that the version that I had not only had the blessing, but it had it transliterated. So I was able to read the English letters and say the blessing in Hebrew. And I began to light candles on Friday night. Meanwhile, I'm going to church on Sunday. Now, you know, the question is asked, why did I have this Haggadah to begin with in my drawer? Well, it turns out that, like I said, my family was secular, but we happened to have uh, we did one Jewish thing each year, and that was Passover. Of course, our Passover Seder didn't look like what our Passover Seder looks like now. Um, this is what our Passover Seder looked like. We would come to my grandparents' house. We would walk in, and my great-grandmother would greet us with a good yantif, which I had no idea what that meant. Uh, for those of you who don't know Yiddish, good yantif means basically good yom tov or happy holiday. And uh, But in Yiddish, but yeah, Bubby would, would greet us with good Yantif and we would come in and my grandfather would pull out this stack of Maxwell House Passover Haggadahs that he had collected over the years from the grocery store and he would pass them out to us and he would say something like, okay, everybody open to page 25. So we would open the Haggadah, he would read one paragraph, we would sing the, the chorus to the song Dayenu and then we would eat. And we did have matzah, but we also ate a whole lot of other things that you would not consider kosher for Passover. Um, right. But that's what we did each year. And I had a fond family memory of doing this each year. So when I got married, I asked my grandmother if it would be okay for me to take one of these Haggadahs with me into my marriage. You know, and it stayed buried in that drawer until these years in the future when I suddenly remembered that I had it and I used it to be able to make the blessing over lighting the candles on Friday night. So now I'm lighting candles on Friday night and I'm going to church on Sunday. A little while later, one day, my husband comes running down the stairs all excited and he says to me, I was reading in the New Testament. No, I was reading in the Old Testament. Sorry. I was reading in the Old Testament, which of course is the Jewish Tanakh, the, that Christianity has taken, has rearranged the order of the books and retranslated some things. But um, I was reading in the Old Testament and it says in there that there are some things that God told the Jewish people that they're supposed to do forever. He said, and if forever really means forever, then my Jewish wife and my Jewish children need to be doing these things as well. Now, one of the things that I kind of caution people when they're listening to me, now, I think most of your viewers can identify a little bit better, but a lot of people say to me, you know, Panina, it sounds like you were all over the map religiously. And I explain to them that actually we weren't. If you step back and you take a look at the broad picture, what you see is a journey of two people who were on a journey of truth. We were seeking truth. And in fact, early on in our marriage, when we discovered that the Christmas tree, for example, had no origin, you know, had pagan origins, we stopped using a Christmas tree to celebrate Christmas. So here we are, my husband's telling me that there's something that God told the Jewish people that they're supposed to do forever. And so I was like, okay, what's that? And he said to me, well, it says in the Old Testament that God told the Jewish people that they're not supposed to eat pork or shellfish. And I was like, um, wait a minute, no ham and cheese sandwiches? And he said, um, no. I was like, I have to think about that for a minute. But in the end, of course, I decided that if this is what God wanted me to do, because I wanted to serve God in truth, mm -hmm. that I would do it. And so I stopped eating pork and shellfish. And so now here I am. I'm lighting candles on Friday night. I'm not eating pork or shellfish, and I'm still going to church on Sunday. Well, a little while later, excuse me, I just need a drink real quick. That's all right. Sorry about that. I do the same thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, um, a little while later, I was reading in the New Testament and I came across the passage that talks about head covering. And um, I was a little confused by the wording. And so at the time, my husband was not our, the pastor of our congregation. So we invited the pastor of our congregation, who happened to also be a Greek scholar, to come and explain the passage to me. Because it was very hard to understand. Was it saying that men should cover their head and women shouldn't? Or women should cover their head and men shouldn't? What, what did it mean? So the pastor came over and he sat down 
And he said, well, you know, it's kind of a complicated passage. And I'm like, yeah, I know. That's why we invited you here. Right. It was like, no, really, it, you know, in the Greek, it's hard to tell which word is modifying which word in this passage and da, 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 da. And I said, okay, pastor, what do you think it means? And he said to me, well, what I believe that it means is that married women should cover their head when praying. He said, but I can't teach that because women today, they don't want to hear it. Now, if you're a person who's seeking truth, an answer like that is not going to be satisfactory. It's certainly not going to be enough to keep you from doing what you believe to be right, right? So, especially if you've already given up ham sandwiches. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided that I would start covering my head when I prayed, and so um, I started with a hat, and because of course I didn't have any examples to follow. So I got a hat. The problem is I'm very ADHD, which anybody who's following my story can probably tell simply by the way that I tell it. Um, but I found that, you know, when I wanted to talk to God, I would put the hat on. And then, and then when I was done, I would go and I would put the hat down. And the next time I wanted to talk to God, I first had to find my hat before, you know, I'm like, hang on a second there, big guy. And I would go and I would right. run and try to find the hat. And then I wouldn't be able to find the hat. And by the time I found the hat, I forgot what it was I wanted to say to God. So I decided there had to be a better solution. I decided that what I would do instead is I would buy a scarf because I could put the scarf around my neck. And when I wanted to pray, I could put the scarf over my head and then I could just lower it down to my neck. And that way I wouldn't have to go looking for it when I decided to pray. So um, I bought the scarf. And then I realized that I pray throughout the day, right? We all do. We all stop and talk to God. You know, mm -hmm. I joke when I'm telling my, when I'm telling my story to a large audience, I'll often say, you know, you're standing at the kitchen sink, washing the dishes and the kids are screaming in the back and you kind of just go like, God, please make them stop. And even that as silly as the example is, is also prayer. And so I discovered that I was putting on my scarf and taking off my scarf all day long, on with the scarf, off with the scarf, on with the scarf, off with the scarf. And I finally decided, forget it. I'm just going to wear the scarf all the time. That way I don't have to worry about taking on or off or any of that. Right. So, um, so here I am now, I'm covering my head all the time. I'm not eating pork or shellfish. I'm lighting candles on Friday night. And going to church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Well, something began to happen inside of me. At the time, I didn't know what it was. Now, looking back, I call it my spiritual identity crisis. I believe that my Jewish neshama, my Jewish soul, began to be at war with my Christian beliefs. And I had this restlessness going on inside of me. So my parents came to visit us. We were in England at the time. And my parents came to visit us. I was about to have my second child. And um, last I had left my parents. They were attending a nice little Assembly of God church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I'm helping my mom unpack her suitcase. And one of the suitcases is full of Judaica items. Kippahs, tzitzit, uh, sitters, shofars, you name it. And I looked at my mom and I was like, mom, what's with the Jewish stuff? And she said, well... While we were in Pittsburgh, we came across a group of Jewish people who also believe in Jesus, and they found a way to synthesize their Jewish heritage with their Christian beliefs, and they call themselves Messianic Jews. Well, I had never heard of Messianic Jews at that point, but she had got my attention. I was very curious. And so a year later, when we came back to the United States, we sought out one of these messianic congregations. We ended up in Maryland. That's kind of like where we where we started and stopped. That's where we were when we came back from being in England. And um, we started going to this messianic congregation. Now, all along the the path the, during this point, my husband had not had his own congregation, but had served in lay leadership positions in every church that we had been a part of uh, leading up to this point. And it didn't take very long at all in the Messianic congregation before my husband also became a deacon and um, whatever else. And I became the head of women's uh, prayer ministry. And uh, I was on the, we were both on the worship team and um, different things like that. So very, very active in the congregation. And, um, 
at one point, my father says to us, you know, we're traveling an hour to go to services every Shabbat. Um, maybe we should start our own congregation. I mean, after all, Paul is a pastor and Panina, you're so talented in the areas that you are. And I and your mother are very administrative and the four of us together could really, you know, we could start something really special. And so my husband and I went and we prayed about it and we decided that this is what God wanted us to do. And so we started a messianic congregation. Now, I thought to myself, if we're going to be doing something Jewish, because it's called Messianic Jewish, right? Uh, I know a little something about Judaism, shouldn't we? And so I decided to go to the Jewish bookstore to find a book on Judaism. And the first book that I found had an intriguing title. It, uh, By the way, I discovered that the Jewish bookstore has lots of books on Judaism. But I found a title that I was was very interesting to me. And it was called How to Run a Traditional Jewish Household. Right? And it's by a woman named Blue Greenberg. It's a very, she's a very modern Orthodox Jewish woman. Mm -hmm. And throughout the book, instead of using the word Orthodox, she tended to choose to use the word Torah observant. And as I read, I thought, you know, I like the sound of that. Maybe that's what we need to be. Maybe we need to be Torah observant Messianic Jews. And so I went back to the Jewish bookstore and I bought so many books so that I could learn everything that there was to learn about being Jewish. I started with the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, which is the abridged uh, code of Jewish law. I bought books on keeping kosher. I bought co books on the laws of family purity, on keeping Shabbat, you name it. And I learned everything that you can about being an Orthodox Jew from a book. Now you cannot learn everything about being an Orthodox Jew from a book, but everything you could learn from a book, I did. And we began to make changes in our lives. Not only was I covering my head all of the time, but I began to dress modestly, as did my daughter. My husband and son um, started wearing a kippah and tzitzit. And if you had run into us on the street, you would have thought we were an Orthodox Jewish family, just like any Orthodox Jewish family in Borough Park or in Baltimore or in Jerusalem, you would not have known that we were also Messianic, that we also believed in Jesus. And um, so we started this Torah observant Messianic congregation. And we ran that for three years with my parents. Um, during that time, I also was a keynote speaker at many Messianic events, especially women's Messianic events. And um, but as you can imagine, sometimes working hand in hand with your parents can be tense. And my husband and I started to burn out and we decided that we valued our relationship with my parents more than our position uh, as leaders of this congregation. And so we decided to leave the congregation and my parents did continue to run it for a few more years. And we we did some experimenting first. We went to a Seventh Day Adventist church for a little while, and then we ended up with another in another in a Messianic congregation in um, the Washington D.C. area. Now, there was also a Messianic congregation in Baltimore, Maryland, which was actually not really very close to where we lived. But one day, <coughs> excuse me. One day we were at this Messianic congregation at an event um, in Baltimore. And after the, after the services, we were standing around and this lovely woman is trying to convince me that the food is kosher because she can tell by looking at me that that might be something that's important to me. And she stops in the middle of her sentence and she says to me, how would you like to buy a nice big five bedroom house in Upper Park Heights in Baltimore? Now, Upper Park Heights was the heart of the Orthodox Jewish community in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And without missing a beat, she says, in fact, I believe that God wants you to buy this house. Now, it's funny because uh, when I'm telling my story to an entirely Jewish audience, they find that the most hilarious thing they've ever heard, that this woman just stopped in the middle of her sentence and said that she knew that God wanted me to buy the house. However, many of the people who are watching today are very familiar with this um, type of speech. Mm -hmm. And uh, Anyway, it's not something that's surprised me a lot, but I did think, you know, like a little odd 
Uh, I like to say, I think thought she was a few French fries short of a happy meal. <laughs> but anyway, so I was like, I'm not good at confrontation. How do I get myself out of this situation? And so I said, well, I know how I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to blame it on my husband, right? Marriage 101, right. when in doubt, blame it on your husband. Works right. great every time. So I said, well, you know, I need to talk to my husband. So I went over to my husband and I knew what he was going to say. He was going to say, like, we're, we're living in, um, we were living in Maryland, but nowhere near Baltimore. And he was working in Northern Virginia. And we were going to a Messianic congregation in Northern Virginia. And for those of you who don't know, they're all in the same area. But between Northern Virginia and Baltimore, it's quite a drive. And um, it by the time we left, it was actually a two-hour commute. But anyway, so... Um, sorry, something just came up on my phone and it distracted me. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I knew what he was going to say. He was going to say, what, are you crazy? And I was going to go back to her and say, my husband says no. And that was going to be the end of the conversation. And I would be very happy with that situation. Mm -hmm. And so I went to my husband and I told him about how this woman asked me if we were, would, that she told me that wanted us to buy this house and he instead of telling me he was crazy was which is what he was supposed to say he says well we could take a look at it and i like to say that that was the first and last time i was ever speechless <laughs> but after picking myself up from shock i went over to the woman and i said my husband says we could take a look at it so we made an appointment and we went to see the house when we pulled up i had a very interesting thing happen as we pulled up in front of the house i felt this voice if you will uh, say to me, you're home. Hmm. I don't know why. I don't know, you know, what it was about being there. Um, sometimes I wonder if it was all of the Jewish souls that I was feeling connected to as I arrived. But anyway, I felt that God was telling me, you're home. So anyway, we walked inside. We fell in love with the house. It was this very large home, three times the size of the house that we were living in. I was homeschooling my four children in one small room in the dining room. The walls were beginning to close in on me. And so yeah. we fell in love with the house. We were really excited about it, but we wanted to know if this was what God wanted or not. And so we went back to our Messianic congregation and we asked them to pray for us to see if it was God's will that we buy this house. So they held a special prayer meeting for the purpose. And Miracle of miracles, all 250 members of the congregation unanimously agreed that it was God's will for us to buy this house. Why? Because who better to convert Orthodox Jews to Messianic Judaism than Messianic Jews who look and act like Orthodox Jews, right? right. And so they sent us out with their blessing. We bought the house and we moved in. Now, we moved in on a Sunday, but we realized that Shabbat was coming and the Baltimore Messianic congregation was not in walking distance from the house that we were living in. And we realized that if we got in a car and we drove on Shabbat, we would have absolutely no witness to all of our neighbors because they weren't going to listen to a word we had to say, right? So what should we do? So my husband and I prayed about it. And we decided that on Shabbat, we would go to one of the more than a dozen Orthodox synagogues in the neighborhood. And during the week, we would go to our midweek Bible study to get our fill of Yeshua. So which Messianic congregation do we go to? Well, it turns out that the rabbi of the bookstore that we were frequenting also happened to be a congregational rabbi in Baltimore. And it was in walking distance of our house. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we decided that we would go to his congregation. Now, a little aside, this nice woman who sold us our house, um, she had taken it upon herself three years before when she had moved in to go knocking door to door to tell all of her Jewish neighbors, just in case they didn't know that they were all hopelessly lost and going to burn in hell because they didn't believe in Jesus. Right. So when she told them that she was selling the house, you can imagine how ecstatic they were until she also told them that a nice messianic family was moving in. Uh -oh. And of course nobody knew what to do. Right. right. Because you know, Orthodox Jews know how to live amongst non-Jews for the most part, uh, those who live in the Western world anyway. But how do you live next door to Jewish people whose goal, whose sole uh, goal is to 
convert you and your family. And so we had kind of a, a bit of a cold shoulder reception when we first moved in. But uh, anyway, so we decided that on Shabbat, we would go to this Messianic, uh, sorry, to this Orthodox synagogue. And fortunately for us, it was about a quarter of a mile from our house, which means they didn't know that we were the missionaries that had just moved in. Right. And um, so we went to the congregation and it was an amazing experience. The people there were incredible. They helped me to find where we were reading in the Torah reading. They helped me to figure out where we were in the Siddur. And on the other side of the Mechitza, that's the divider in the Orthodox synagogue, what happens when a new guy comes to town? What do you do? You offer him an aliyah, right? You offer him to be called up to the Torah to read from the Torah. So um, when my husband shows up in a kippah and a talit and, you know, tzitzit, and he has a sitter and he's got these three little boys with him that also look very Jewish and he appears to be davening, praying from the sitter. Um, they offered him an aliyah to the Torah. And my husband, who is a man of incredible integrity, told them, I'm not Jewish. Now, when I'm sharing my story with Jewish people, I share with them that this is not always the case and um, that oftentimes what will happen is non-Jews who have been going to Messianic congregations and have learned how to make the blessings over being called up to the Torah, or some have even learned how to lane, how to read from the Torah, would have accepted that invitation without telling the truth. And they would have given them the fake Hebrew name that they had made up. And I often share with my Jewish audiences that I feel that they're committing a crime against the Jewish people. And if somebody is watching this right now, you know, I don't care how good your intentions are. If you are pretending to be something that you're not and being counted in a minion, you know, you need to ask God if this is the right thing to do, because we're called to be people of integrity. Right. So anyway, uh, but my husband is a man of integrity and he did say, I'm not Jewish. And, and so, um, but we had, you know, they, they didn't do anything. It was a fantastic experience. We had an amazing experience. We went home and after doing this for a couple of weeks, my husband, who is a man of tremendous integrity, says to me, you know, I think that we need to tell the rabbi that we believe in Yeshua um, because it's going to come out eventually. And we certainly don't want him to feel that we've been lying to him. And we don't want him to feel that we've betrayed him mm -hmm. when it does come out. And I said to him, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't see that ending well. But my husband insisted and I eventually relented and we invited the rabbi to come speak to us. And now the rabbi knew because my husband had mentioned that he wasn't Jewish and he knew that I was Jewish. I'm trying to remember why he did. But anyway, so what do you think that he thought we were inviting him to come talk about when we invited him to our home? conversion right makes, mm -hmm. sense. makes sense what else would we be wanting to talk so he comes in and my husband starts telling him what he believes and after a minute or so the rabbi stops him and he says well wait a minute you don't believe that anymore do you to which my husband says yeah so in the moment that it took for absolute shock to register on the rabbi's face i began to get really upset. I saw my world implode because we had just bought this big expensive house. We couldn't turn around and sell it. And if they kicked us out of the shul, what we were going to do, I was homeschooling my kids. Who knows what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Maybe they're going to beat, beat my kids up. Maybe they're going to take our picture and put them on a poster and post them on the lamppost going down the street. that said, you know, warning missionaries. I mean, who knows what they were going right. to do. And so I started to cry because I'm an emotional female and that's what I do. I cry. Well, at that point, the rabbi turns to me and he says, what do you believe? Now, I'm here to tell you that at this point in my story, I had been a Christian or Messianic for 17 years. OK, I knew exactly what I believed. I had been responsible for bringing hundreds, if not thousands of people to Christianity. All right. It's not like I didn't know what I believed. But in that moment of emotionality, I just kind of was like, Rabbi, I don't know what I believe. And I begged him, please, please don't kick us out of the shul. So the rabbi sat there for the longest time. In fact, I was wondering if he was ever going to say anything ever again to me. But when he did speak, 
He said the most important words that anyone has ever said to me anywhere along my Jewish journey. He said to me, you are a Jew, no matter what you believe, even though what you believe is not Judaism. He said, let me be clear. It's not Judaism. It's not kosher. It's not okay. But as a Jewish woman, you have a responsibility before God to fulfill the commandments that God has given the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. He said, therefore, I'm going to allow you and the children to continue to come to the shul. Now, he wasn't sure what to do with my husband. And so he said, for a time being, you know, I don't want him coming to the synagogue. He said, uh, but there's one caveat. He said, I want you to talk to a guy from an organization called Jews for Judaism. Now, I had never heard of Jews for Judaism before, but I'm not stupid. Jews for Jesus, Jews for Judaism. They probably don't like people like me very much. Mm -hmm. But I reluctantly agreed because what else was I going to do? I didn't want to talk to the guy, but I knew that if I didn't agree, the rabbi wasn't going to let me keep coming to the shul. So I agreed. And I put it off figuring he'll forget and we'll just, you know, keep the status quo. But he didn't forget. And he kept reminding me. And eventually I had to give in. And I made a phone call to the guy. Maybe you know him. His name is Mark Powers. He was at that time the director of the Baltimore Jewish uh, Jews for Judaism. Um, and so I made an appointment and Mark came by. So Mark comes over to the house and he walks in. And the first thing he says to us is, so let's talk about why you think Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. I thought to myself, man, you start every conversation this way. But anyway, so he came in and he sat down and my husband was perfectly good, glad, happy to be doing the talking. And I was perfectly happy to let him. And so he threw out a verse, right? The question was, why do you think Jesus is the Jewish Messiah? So my husband said, because he was born of a virgin. So Mark says, well, let's take a look at that. And he opens up his Bible to Isaiah chapter seven. And he says to me, now, Panina, you've read this verse in its context before, right? I said, of course, I read my Bible every year from cover to cover. He said, okay, but when you read it, whenever you read through the Old Testament, you see Jesus on every page, right? And I said, of course, what else could it be speaking about? And he said to me, well, I want you to do me a favor. Just this once. I want you to read this chapter with me from the perspective of the people who were alive during the time that Isaiah was writing this, which was 700 years before Jesus ever walked on earth. 700 years before the destruction of the temple. He said, would you be willing to do that for me? And I said, sure. And so for the first time in 17 years, I read through Isaiah chapter 7 without the glasses, without the lenses, that it had to be talking about Jesus. And of course, we all know what I discovered. It's not. It's not even a messianic passage. And of course, verse 14, which is the classic verse of the virgin birth, has to be mistranslated in order to understand it, to say what Christianity says it says. Yeah. Well, we only touched on one other corollary issue and Mark left, but he left me with an awful lot to chew on because if this one core belief that I had held for 17 years was a lie, what else did I believe that was a lie? And so over the course of the next few weeks, I kept coming back to his office and I'd say, well, what about this verse? And he'd say, well, let's take a look at that. And, you know, I wasn't going to take his word for it. Of course, I started studying it in the Hebrew myself, but I also went back to my Christian friends. I went to the Jews for Judy, <laughs> Jews for Jesus forum. It was really funny. Just a little aside. I don't always get to share this, but um, at, in those days, Jews for Jesus used to have an online chat room and I I was desperate, desperate. I write about this in my book. I was desperate for somebody to be right for clarity. And so I, I was asking God, you know, please show me who's right here. And so I logged into the, this uh, Jews for Jesus chat room uh, under the name Seeker, which was probably a mistake. But anyway, they thought I was a plant. They thought I was a missionary plant. And um, I said, please give me a reason to keep believing. And they kicked me out of the, the chat room. Um, wow. And yeah. And my husband is very interesting because he was completely a Christian, you know, at that time. Mm -hmm. 
he, but I was sharing with him because we have a fantastic relationship and he actually wrote to Jews for Jesus and says, I want you to know that what happened in this chat room last night basically may have sealed the deal for my wife rejecting Jesus and it's your fault. And uh, so anyway, but uh, so I went back to my messianic and Christian friends and I said, you know, I've always believed this verse to say this, but Judaism says it means this. What do you have to say about it? And unfortunately, really, most of the time, when you got right down to it, the bottom line was, we know what it looks like, but we know Jesus is the Messiah. You know, what are you going to do with that? So one by one, the bricks of the foundation of my faith were being pulled out. And eventually, the entire structure had to collapse. Mm -hmm. Of course, at that point, I had to figure out, what did I believe at all? Like, if all of this was a lie, do I still believe in God? And if I do still believe in God, is the Bible his word? Is the, is the Old Testament his word to the Jewish people? And even if it is, what does that mean for me as a Jewish woman? I mean, do I need to be Orthodox or is it okay to be something else? And, and so I had to go through this whole process of figuring out what I believe. And it brought me to Torah observant Orthodox Judaism. Now, meanwhile, my husband the pastor is feeling like his right arm's been cut off. His entire world's been turned upside down. And we had this amazing relationship up until that moment. But then all of a sudden, everything that he said to me was offensive to him. And everything he said to everything I said to him was offensive to him. And everything he said was offensive to me. And the two of us began fighting. And everybody was sure we were going to end up divorced, not because of the difference in faith as much as all of the fighting that was going on. And this went on for two years. Now, meanwhile, my son, my children at that point are six, eight, 10, and 12 years old. And my 12-year-old son is less than a year from bar mitzvah. And I realized that they're not going to bar mitzvah him if he still believes in Yeshua. So I began to talk with him and shared with him. And I basically shared with him exactly like I told you. I said, you know, we used to believe that this verse means this. Judaism says it means this. I want you to sit down and decide for yourself which is the truth. Now, as a homeschooling mom, he didn't really have much of a choice um, because I gave it to him as an assignment. But he went through most of the major claims and made a decision for himself as to what he believed was the truth. And he also came to the conclusion that Torah true Judaism was the truth. And so almost a year later, he was bar mitzvahed. We had a big backyard party. And, um, and what's interesting is, is that even though my husband really did not like Mark, he agreed that he had been such a big part of our, our life over the last year. So he agreed that we could invite him to the bar mitzvah. And uh, so we had this big backyard party and I looked out the windows at some point. Now, also, during this year, I had been sharing with my dad all of the things that I had been coming across, sharing with my husband and sharing with my dad. And, you know, I would say to my dad, hey, dad, have you looked at this about the virgin birth? And, you know, my dad decided that he was going to prove Judaism wrong. Every verse that I came up, came to him with, he researched in depth, messianic, Christian, traditional Christian arguments, everything to try to show me how Judaism was wrong and that the Christians actually had it right, or at least the Messianics had it right. And in the end, he had to admit that Judaism was the truth. And so little by little, he was also coming towards Judaism. Not completely, although it's interesting because the congregation, which had started out around 100 people, by the time that we got to this point, had only a few left because as he began to discover these new truths, he began to change the way he was teaching. And so they started to drop like flies. But uh, anyway, so here we are at the bar mitzvah and I'm looking out the window and who is my dad talking to but Mark Powers. And a few hours later, I look out the window again. And my husband, my father, rather, is still talking 
to Mark Powers. What he was doing was he was clarifying all of the little loose threads that he still had from all of our conversations. And by the end of the day, my father and my mother had decided to come back to Judaism as well. So, yeah, so I had come back to Judaism and my parents had come back to Judaism. My children had come back to Judaism. So for the next year following the bar mitzvah, my husband and I had a very, very rough time. And uh, I wrote a little bit about his battle with really feeling forsaken by God and even suicidal at times uh, because he just wanted the pain to stop. It was such a painful experience for him. Um, And um, so a year later, one day we were having, so it's two years after I came back to Judaism, we were having an argument. And by the way, you know, there were those in the community who did try to convince me to divorce him, but I loved him so much that it made me sick to think about leaving him. And it's really interesting. I had a Chavruta study partner, partner who in a moment of prophecy, I mean, it was straight from Hashem. She said to me, you know, there's a Hasidish concept that you struggle with an idea for seven years. And if after seven years, you still haven't gotten a hold of it, you let it go. She said, why don't you give your husband seven years, right? Give him seven years. And if after seven years, he's still where he's at right now, then you can consider leaving him. So what she did was gave me permission to just relax a little bit and to actually live. And so, you know, I'd I'd like to encourage any of your viewers who maybe are dealing with a spouse who has different beliefs than them, you know, that that this is an encouraging part of my story, if you will. But um, so two years after I had come back to Judaism, my husband and I were having a fight one night and um, he said something that really just got me. And I said to him, you know, you're just saying that because you're a Christian. To which he says to me, well, actually, no, I'm not. I was like, what? He said, no, really, over the course of the last two years, you've given me enough reason to doubt the validity of the New Testament. He said, I no longer believe in Jesus. He said, but I'm not necessarily ready to convert to Judaism either because I haven't been convinced that Judaism is the truth with a capital T. And I certainly don't want to exchange one flawed religion for another. So, of course, at that point, my husband was what we would consider a Noahide, a Ben Noah, a righteous Gentile. Uh, He believed in God, but he didn't know what else he believed in. And, um, you know, he certainly believed in the law of of the the Torah. And um, but that changed our status in the community. And so we were able to then begin to integrate into the community. I mean, he was still held at a little bit of a distance and as was I, but um, we started attending classes in the community. And at one point, about four years after, and he had been living as an Orthodox Jew this whole time, um, about four years after I had come back to Judaism, he and I had a discussion and he was like, you know, what does Judaism have to offer me? And I said, you know, I think you need to stop asking the question what Judaism has to offer you and start asking the question why God gave you a Jewish wife and Jewish children. What was the point of this to make us suffer? Mm -hmm. And so he began to approach the question from a different angle and it didn't take long before he actually started to look into some of the things that he was still questioning. And four and a half years after I came back to Judaism, my husband decided that Judaism was the truth with a capital T and he converted to Judaism. And so Paul Michael Taylor became Pinchas Moshe and uh, we were married under the chuppah in the Etz Chaim Center in Baltimore uh, in the presence of people in the community who had been with us all along. Yeah, so that's a basic story. I then went on to work with Jews for Judaism for a couple of years. I started my own counter missionary organization. And then um, after arriving in Israel, I realized I started doing a lot of personal growth work. I'm also a life coach. And I started doing a lot of personal growth work and realized that being just a counter missionary was a lot of tearing things down. And I wanted to spend the rest of my life building things up. And so I decided to change my focus from fighting Christianity and Christian beliefs to helping inspire Jews 
Um, and recently I've been more involved in helping to support um, Jews who have returned, Balei Tshuva and converts, um, who often, you know, once they come to Judaism, there's kind of this gap that they sometimes fall between the cracks mm -hmm. between their initial um, outreach experience, whatever that is, or conversion, and being fully integrated into the community. There's a gap in there. And there's a phenomenon that um, is a little bit of a, a disillusionment after the honeymoon period is over. So I'm actually working on a talk right now called The Five Stages of Teshuva, and it really applies to both, but all new Jews, if you will, um, to try to help the Jewish community to learn how to provide programming and integrate and support Jews, new Jews, whether they be Balei Tshuva or converts, um, to help them to straddle that gap so that they don't That's fall wonderful. between the cracks. That's wonderful. It's often a problem it's among a orthodoxy problem that, or orthodoxy. I guess all Judaism, really, Jews really, that they don't accept um, the Jewishness of converts. And Rambam talks a lot about that, that, when a person converts, a person should be accepted as as fully Jewish, but often for converts, that's not what they're experiencing. So I have I have experienced the opposite in most of the communities that I have been a part of. Um, converts are fully accepted as complete Jews without any question. The problem is is that there are a lot of people out there calling themselves rabbis who don't have valid smicha. There are a lot of people who are doing conversions without any um, 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 responsibility to larger organizations to check them. And so we honestly, we, not me, because I don't make such judgments, but right. But there is a question as to whether or not the conversions are valid. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you're seeing this problem that's interpreted as um, a, a not accepting of converts, whereas it's actually, and I know this is semantical, but it's not not accepting converts. It's questioning the conversion. Right. Once, they are, once the conversion has been accepted, they are completely enveloped in the community. Now, what I'm talking about, that gap, is a different thing. That's okay. that's not acceptance. That's support. Okay, right. you become a you convert to Judaism or you come back to Judaism as a sec, from a sec from secular Judaism because you see something somewhere either in the scriptures or in a mentor that you have um, attached yourself to that you see is beautiful mm -hmm. and and godly and and that's what you want. And then the reality of a huge thousands year old religion that has quite a wide variety of people in it hits you in the face, right. right? You see that not everybody who's orthodox, who wears a uniform or calls himself orthodox is genuine, is honest, is caring. And what do you do with that? And, right. and so between that and the fact that a lot of the classes that are available require a certain amount of knowledge, which a brand new Jew doesn't have. So those two things together combine mm -hmm. to create a situation where they're left dangling. And if they're strong or they happen to be of the kind of personality where they make their own support system, they do fine, like I did. I, it's not that I didn't experience that disillusionment period. I did. Right. It's just that I happened to be somebody who was able to make a support system for me. But there's so many people who can't, who don't. And I cannot tell you how many people I know who have converted to Judaism or come back to Judaism. And then a year or two later, they've completely given up their observance because there was no net to catch them. True. And True. that's what I, where I'm trying to work right now uh, primarily is in providing that net. Right. That's a, that's great. That's a wonderful net needed thing. That's good. So, um, okay. Do we have any questions or anything? Right. I've been sort of keeping a basic eye on here, but I would like to go ahead and real quickly welcome a few people who've joined us. Welcome to Sandra Morell, to uh, Rabbi G. Nechaya Vogel, to Shimon Leibowitz, uh, to Mark Bodkins, to John N. Patricia Hall, to Ronnie James, my good friend Noak, to Dennis Akola, who has joined us. Um, Gloria Christian has joined us. Bassam Eld is here. Um, Hirsch Garfunkel is here. Kat Belcher Brown, who lives here locally, with us. Hi, Kat. Glad you and David are here. Lily Coopers has joined us. Um, what is it? Okay. My wife sort of handles my sounds for me, and she doesn't think I'm coming through clearly enough. How about maybe that's better? 
Yeah, a little bit. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome to Paloma Shella. Uh, Shalom to Isabel Saunders, to David Ben Shaul, uh, Raymond Mordechai, Eduardo Kubalo Sankovic, uh, Lillian Kend, my friend and Hebrew teacher David Deutsch, who says, Don't blame me if he doesn't speak it properly because he has a southern accent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah we already talked about that. <laughs> we did, we did. And that's always my, my, my escape hatch. It's a southern accent thing. It's nothing, you know. Um, Hingi Elisa is here. Carol Oshbel says, What a fascinating story, Penina. Uh, Harry Patrick is here. Lucilin Fantroli. Uh, Raymond Mordecai says, I highly recommend to anyone to watch and listen to her lecture from start to finish. She can change your life for the better if Aww. you're still looking for truth. I totally, totally agree with you, Raymond. And if you will Google her on, uh, Google is, I use that as a generic term, but if you look yeah. on YouTube and all over the place, you'll find tons of videos and stuff with Panina. Do it. It's worth your time. You will be inspired. The thing, one of the thing I wanted to mention about and you. And subscribe. Subscribe to my channel, please. And subscribe to her channel. Uh, but if you'd like, you're welcome to put a link to your, uh, on the Facebook end of it, if you have Facebook open. Uh, or I they, think it's they can go Google. Numbers. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, but I'll add those after we end this uh, as well. Okay, um, but uh, one thing I really loved about Panina is so many of the people who, we talked about this earlier, so many of the people who say that they're counter-missionary, who, who identify as counter-missionary, tend to be really harsh. Yeah. Panina, I think you will agree with me that most people who are sincerely following Christianity, Messianic, so-called Judaism or whatever, they're sincere people. They're yeah. people who love God. They're people who want to know the truth and who are doing the best they can do. We should show love for these people. We should show compassion for these people. I, that's one thing I loved about you and all of your testimony that I found is you never come across. <laughs> Panina said it's about the heaviest that she ever gets is this one guy that was giving her a hard time. And she said, I suggested, you know, have you ever read the Bible? <laughs> or you should read the Bible. Uh, that's about as harsh as she gets. I love that. Um, because I'm the same. I just don't be mean. There's no point. If we've yeah. got the truth, we are happy because we've got the truth. So Baruch Hashem. Now we can share it with other people. But if you accept it or not, it doesn't change our relationship with Hashem. So if we can help, we help. I just I love that about you. I just think it's one of your many, many strengths. Um, Yaakov Uriel has joined us. Carolyn says, start watching the videos from Jews for Judaism. There's such an, I, I totally agree. Uh, Jews for Judaism has some awesome stuff out there. Yeah, Here, and they just posted my story as well. So if somebody can't watch the replay of this or whatever, um, they can watch it on Jews for Judaism. So, I mean, there's like at least three or four different versions of my story out there on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, but Jews for Judaism does. And actually they are about to, I don't know when they're going to have it edited, but when I spoke for them in January, not only did I tell my story, but I also did kind of like a counter missionary crash course. So that's going to be coming up soon, too. Excellent. Excellent. And I'm hoping that you'll come back with me again and we can do some other stuff. I would love if you can do sure. that. Sure. Um, I have to work out the timing because I'm seven hours ahead of you. <laughs> yeah, well, we can. We don't have to do it at this time. This is actually my rabbi um, in the outside <laughs> of the summer months does two to three online classes a week and his are all at 8 p.m eastern time and uh -huh. i didn't want to compete with his because i want to watch his and i want to encourage other people to watch his so that's one reason we ended up doing ours at this time of day but which is good for me because 8 p.m your time is 3 a.m my time and i'm sorry uh, it's not happening that's gonna be worse <laughs> but, me calling you at 3 a.m to come to i'll talk I'm a lot older now. <laughs> but well, we... look. Go ahead, Donald. Go ahead, Donald. Anyway, what, what I would enjoy you doing sometime is making a video with your um, presentations and put that for all to see. I think that would be wonderful. I, uh, I've just been thinking recently, I haven't done a counter missionary presentation in, in quite a few years. I was running one twice a year in Jerusalem, but I, I found that, um, whenever I offered a course, it's a 12 week class. When I offered the course, I would get four or five people who would get really excited about it. 
And unfortunately, if I'm going to offer it at a reasonable fee that people can afford, that's not enough people to make it worth my time. If right. you just think about the numbers of 12 weeks worth of lessons and only four or five people, how much you would have to charge, yeah. it, it becomes a bit it much, does. especially on an Israeli income. Yeah. And so after doing that for several years, I took all of my notes and I put them together and I wrote a book um, called Scripture Twisting. And uh, and that's basically all of the it, it, all of the classes that I taught. But I've actually been thinking recently that it might be time for me to go ahead and offer it online as a series. And uh, so I'm thinking about doing that as a webinar series, a 12 week yeah. series. Well, every, everything that I offer, uh, um, and we, we talked about this earlier. I don't I now for the first time I finally do accept donations, but I don't really. Um, I can't afford to hire people to come on, um, but any time that you, out of the goodness of your heart, are open to sharing with us, we would love it, and we will do it at your schedule. Okay. So whatever uh, yeah. works for you. We can work out some things, yeah. especially informal question and answer kind of yeah. you know, situations where it doesn't require a tremendous amount of pr preparation. Um, that's one of the things that is hard for me to make people understand. If I teach four classes a week and each class takes 10 hours of preparation, then you're talking about a full-time job. Sure. And so, um, you know, one day, God willing, it won't be necessary for me to ask for money. But uh, the Torah is very clear and Halakha is very clear that a, a person who teaches Torah does deserve to get paid. Obviously, right. I also care about people, so I don't want to charge an arm and a leg. I want to make it accessible to as many people as possible. Fortunately, the video age that we live in definitely makes it easier for you to do that because you can reach a lot more people um, and have it available at quite an affordable rate. For sure, for sure. <laughs> I, I appreciate that, and I respect you for your willingness to share in either way. And I totally, completely agree with you. Uh, Sandra Morell says, a wonderful part of her life and that of her husband. Uh, and David Brown um, says uh, that he's sharing this. And I'm going to be sharing it on all of my groups, including Jewish issues. And so it'll get spread a lot, plus it'll be on my YouTube as well. And this one I'm going to put on my, my web page as well. For information about about conversion and about being Jewish and about the entire process, um, Dennis Hap Royal has joined us. My wife says, "Wonderful hearing your background is your channel on YouTube." Yes, there's a YouTube channel, Panina Taylor, um, and most of my Found videos it. are available on there. Okay, could you post her? You did already, okay? And could you find her? This I'm talking to my wife. Could you find her book, the book "Scripture Twisting" by Panina Taylor, and post a link to that also? Super. Yeah. Thank you. And currently my um, story, even though it's shows available on Amazon, I'm currently out of print. If anybody wants to donate, um, I actually have been doing this great process where um, somebody will donate $250, or $500. They get five copies of my book and a dedication page in the front for that printing. So that enables me to print the books and, um, and so if, you know, God touches your heart that you want to yeah. donate 250 or 500 for that, please just message me privately. I didn't mean to plug on oh, your no, video, no. but I don't have any copies of my story right. available at the moment. So I wanted to make that known. Yeah, that's a great way to do that, actually. That's a really good way to do it because people like to – I was talking to a friend of mine because um, I wasn't going to accept – I don't think I even mentioned this to you. I wasn't going to accept any donations. And I had a couple of different rabbis write me and say, you're not being fair to people because there's a blessing to giving. And you're right. stealing that blessing from them, which is why I changed. What a blessing for a lot of people who don't have the knowledge and experience to really reach and teach to be able to give money to help those who can to make it possible. And they should know that in addition to the five copies that I give them as a thank you, um, I also make my story available. Like, for example, on Sunday, I'm going to be going with someone from Yad Lachim, which is the Israeli counter-missionary organization, to um, talk to a 13-year-old boy who has become a Christian through the Seventh-day Adventists online. And he's in Israel. He was raised in a, in a Jewish home. And so, um, you know, it would be delightful um, if I could, but I don't have any copies, uh, to bring him a copy of my mm -hmm. story and uh, I do give them away free 
most of the time. I give quite a few away free when I feel that somebody needs it. So um, know that if you donate to the publishing of my book, it's not just an opportunity for you to give to me because you believe in what I do, but it's also an opportunity to invest in having these copies available for those who need it. I mean, that's great. That's, that's great. wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, Susan, uh, Randles Susan Randles has joined us, who is very active with our synagogue, the House of Seven Beggars. Raymond, by the way, thank you for knowing to um, to mute your mic because the background thing. So a lot of people don't know that. It's great. It's just because I start to hear me and then it goes away. So you're you're doing great on your end. Um, Raymond Mordecai says thanks a lot, Pinnell. Um, share she you know, shared this quite a while ago. Uh, Teshuva Ben Avraham is joining us. Ahuva so says, like you found the channel on YouTube. Who would just post a link to Panina's channel on YouTube? Be sure and subscribe to that and set it so that you get the notices when she posts new videos as well so that you can really stay in touch with her channel there. Uh, Maria Mills has joined us. Sonia Hidalgo Zrito has joined us. My friend Guy Batoski says, does your husband speak about his experiences? You know, that's a really good question. I He doesn't. Um, I mean, he speaks with people one on one. If somebody really wants to talk to him, we can set up a time for you to talk on Skype or Zoom or something. Um, and I tried to put a significant amount of what he went through in my book for that purpose. But um, as far as entertainment goes, his story is not so entertaining so he doesn't speak publicly so much about it but for example perhaps we could arrange for him to come on here and talk with you it would be more of a question answer kind mm -hmm. of thing um but you know he could share a little bit about what he went through which was quite a struggle he described it as he said you know you have a first class ticket for an air flight back he said me i'm walking across the desert dragging my camel mm. with me wow. you know and and that that his struggle to get from where he was to where he ended up was painful and difficult and you know it doesn't make for entertaining stories but a lot of people who are listening can probably really identify with yeah. what he went through is it was it was a trial by fire for him. And I'm very glad that he ended up where he did. And now we have the most amazing marriage that we've ever had. And we're right on the same page. And, and it's funny, my daughter-in-law said, you know, um, Ima, she said, people come to your house for a Shabbat meal the first time because of you, they come for you. She said, but they come back a second time for him. Um, my husband, I believe is, you know, one of the 36 righteous people who keep the world on its Right. uh orbit and um and he's a very very special person and he's been through a lot um so you know if somebody really feels like you know he might have some answers for them i'm happy to put him yeah. in touch with him yeah i would yeah, love I to do that maybe well i'll talk to you about timing okay but i would love to have him on though um sure so let's find a time that would work for him and uh, i would love to do that that'd be wonderful okay sounds good i'll talk to him about it yeah thank you uh, Robert Pulliam is here. Guy says that would be nice. Susan Randall says, I've been listening as much as I can. The Internet is having issues. The, the Internet is having issues almost every day lately, Susan. I, I got you there. We were, by the way, we were supposed to do this last week. And Panina was all ready to go. And I was putting up those banners all the way. Oh, Panina Taylor is coming in. I'm so excited. And then I log on and Zippo. And I'm thinking, Hashem, why are you doing this? Why, you know, but we could not do it. So then I tried with another browser and then Panina tried to go and she couldn't either. And then I realized it's YouTube. YouTube did an update, which usually no, means Facebook. a downgrade. Um, Facebook. Thank you, Facebook. Thank you. Facebook did an upgrade, which typically means a downgrade last week at our time. And two hours later, I just tested and it worked perfectly. I was thinking about this. We talk about when Hashem doesn't act, we try to see, we, we accept that well, this is a Hasidic thing, Breslov. We believe everything that happens, God does. Everything. And mm -hmm. we think God had a reason for everything that happens, and that reason is ultimately for our good. And that by trying to understand that, we can develop our relationship with Hashem. But even if we don't, we say Baruch Hashem, because even if I don't get it, I know he had a reason for this to happen. Typical. Right. Breslov understanding, typical Jewish understanding, I think. So I was thinking about this. Why did this happen? 
Donald had a doctor's appointment last week. He was going to have to leave about halfway through your presentation. He was going to leave at 1. I had a dentist appointment at 2, so I was going to have to shut it down about 15 minutes early. And I have met like five or six people since then who didn't know you were going to be on who want to see you. Two of them are here now that I've seen their names go by. And other people, that's why we didn't get on last week because the right people weren't here and they didn't have the right time. And so Baruch Hashem, this is an example of how Hashem works. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what's even more interesting is in the interim, my internet went down completely and the technician had to come out. And on Thursday, the guy said to me, oh, it's going to be two to three weeks. And I was like, I can't be two to three weeks without internet. And so he said, well, I'll look on Sunday. Sunday's the beginning of the new week. Maybe something will open up. Sunday morning, he calls me. He says, we're going to send a technician out tomorrow, Monday morning. So just the day before yesterday, we got our internet back up. Baruch Hashem. So, See, yeah. You don't always know how these things work out, but if you're willing to just move by Amuna, move by active faith, Hashem will step in and it will all work out. Um, so Susan uh, says, uh, Donald, go ahead. If I, yeah. Because you mentioned your end of it. Mm -hmm. I can remember when I called Panina and I had all of these people tell me, don't call her, it's so early in the morning and blah, blah. I was having a problem with a particular rabbi. I'm not getting into all of that. But I knew Panina knew what was going on? Bless her heart, three o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, sometime like that. I woke this young lady up. Now, you got to remember, I'm old enough to be her father, I think. Anyway, oh, maybe. I woke her up, told her the situation. She came online, took care of the situation. This is a woman who truly knows Hashem. Amen. Hashem. And this is a woman who, as I've told you before, I think the world of. She really and truthfully has been an inspiration in my personal life more than she will ever know. Well, you know, there's and, a saying there's a saying behind every good man there's a woman. If if her husband actually is one of those thirty six, he he needs a wife like Penina. So okay. <laughs> Thank you for your kind words, gentlemen. Um yeah. Now um I have a group of uh, Jewish ladies that I um, teach each week. It's called Spiritual Mentoring Group. Uh, for a while, I had a group called Navigating Judaism that, um, that uh, also involved non-Jewish women, Noahides and uh, people who were seeking conversion and things like that. If I have enough ladies that would be interested in starting another group like that, I would be willing to put something together. So just PM me and let me know. That'd be wonderful. That'd be wonderful. We have, um, I think it's six uh, groups at allfaith.com that on Facebook that we're using. And um, we can let people know about that and help make that happen as well. Um, that sounds, I think that'd be absolutely awesome. Um, couple more comments here. Maria Mill says, I'm late. Shalom to Rabbi Shlomo Ahuva, Panina, and Willinger. Uh, thank you all, uh, Panina, for visiting with us. We appreciate it. Yisrael Killian is joining us, and Guy says, Amen. So we are through all the comments that we had. Um, if you have a question for Panina, it can really be on any of these related topics. If you are sure. a Christian who is struggling with some of these issues, I don't want to get into a big messianic debate thing here. But if you've got a legitimate question that you didn't like my answer or you're just still having the question, feel free to ask that question. If you would like um, to join her for this women's group she's talking about, um, you'll see her name. I'll be sure and post a link. Well, Hoover's already posted a link now. So go to there and just follow the links and write her and let her know that you're interested in doing that. If you want to donate to more publications of her books, let her know. Um, I will tell you, I think that this is, I, I, I go a lot by what I feel when it comes to people, and I feel really good about you. I did when we, almost immediately when we talked the other day. Um, I just feel like I can just totally endorse you without reservation. So uh, anybody, I mean, not that my endorser matters, but, 
But anybody, though, that's interested in finding someone, I think you'd be an awesome person uh, for the women especially to contact and uh, to help. And I love that you're trying to be that net for people. That's great. Carolyn uh, Oshpelt says, I would be very interested to join a group for women, Panina. Um, there's the old, there was a movie here in America about the baseball field, and they said, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. I got a feeling, Panina, that if you build it, they will come. <laughs> and I will uh, make sure that we're 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 sharing the information on our groups, um, and uh, or we can make one of my groups, and you can be one of the admin. We'll have more, you know, that way. But whatever, I'm, I'd love to work with you. However, you want to work together, but I would love to refer people to you and try to help make such a group take off. Uh, my guess is who would be interested as well. She's nodding. Um, <laughs> So we would love to uh, we would we would love to have you do that and to be able to take part in it, and I really do appreciate it. Do we have any other questions for Panina Taylor? This is a rare opportunity that you've got, friends, to ask some some solid questions. Raymond Mordecai says, "I am Benin Noak for a number of years now because of Panina." So thank you so much again. Baruch Hashem. Thank Baruch you. Hashem. Uh, Guy says, "Find dreams, good pictures." Oh, Field of Dreams is a good picture. The movie oh. Field of Dreams. It was a good picture. I couldn't remember the name of it. I just remembered the little signal if you built it. Called, Field of Dreams. Uh, yeah. that, that is a, it's a very inspiring movie, though, because it really is. I was, you know, if you want something and you've got mm. faith in Hashem, you pray and you say, Hashem, I really need this. I want this to happen. And you go into hit, butter, do this time of personal prayer. But there's one little secret here. If you sit on your couch and say, Hashem, make it happen, nothing's going to happen. Nine times out of ten, you're going to be sitting on your couch this time next year. But if you get off of your couch and you start making it happen, we are responsible for the doing of it. But Hashem is responsible for the results of it. So it's up to Hashem whether or not it works. But it's up to us to do our part to make it happen. So Rabbi Rabbi Nachman Breslov says... Um, if you don't know the purpose, what's the purpose? You've got to know what you want if you're going to have it. And you've got to hammer through with it. Uh, and Panina is a great example of that because she knew she wanted God and she followed her heart and she did what seemed right. And then when the time came, Hashem said, you know what? Time to come home. And now look at what she's doing, blessing all these, these people and doing it with this love and humility of spirit, which is just absolutely awesome. I truly so. doubt you could meet and know Panina Taylor without Panina touching your life. And you will grow from that experience. I know I did. I attended a class. I think I told you about virtual yeshiva. She was on virtual yeshiva teaching a class. I was honored by being invited to that class. And as I said, she touched my life with that class and I grew. Amen is certainly a wonderful teacher. Um, there is no if, ands, or buts. She will touch your life if you allow her to. Okay, so, guys, I have a request. Mm-hmm. You got to stop because otherwise I'm going to start crying, okay? All right. So I have another question for you. How did sure. you end up moving to Israel? Because you live in Israel now, right? Yes. How yes. did that happen? So um, at some point, well, I'll even back up a little bit and give you a piece of the story that I don't always tell. When we were messianic, we had a visit by a couple of well-known messian, a me- very well-known messianic couple who had written a book. Um, last name is Berkowitz, and I, I know the book. <laughs> think the book was the. It's not the Call of the Torah. Um, it's ugh, now I can't remember the name of the book. But well, anyway, we don't want to advertise it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Doesn't no. matter what the name was. Yeah. Very well known right. messianic couple right. wrote a book, and when they came back to the United States, they had, they had moved to Israel. And when they came back to the United States on a visiting, speaking tour, whatever, they came to our home for a meal, and we sat and we talked with them for a while, and they were talking about their experiences in Israel and how wonderful it was and how. Um, you know, it's a great place for children. And my husband and I started getting really interested up until that point. It was nothing more than a place like a storybook place, you know, like Mm -hmm. a place from the Bible. Right. So, um, so we looked into how you make Aliyah 
and we got the application from the Jewish agency and we're filling out the application and it says, what's your affiliation? So I looked at my husband, I'm like, you know, they're not going to let Messianics make Aliyah. So what do we write here? So we decided to write unaffiliated. But then further down on the thing, it said that you have to have a letter certifying your Jewishness from a rabbi. I was like, well, we can explain that we're unaffiliated so we don't have a rabbi to write this letter. But then we saw that it said it, they wanted a picture of the family. And I was like, they're not going to buy that we're unaffiliated if we look like a bunch of Chabadniks. So we look like an Orthodox Jewish family. Mm -hmm. Remember, I mentioned that in my story. So we kind of like shelved it until we could figure out how to get through the whole process, realizing also that we would probably have to lie in the process. And we didn't want to do that. So we shelved the idea for a while. Meanwhile, my whole story unfolds and my husband and I both become Jewish. And during that time, my parents discover Israel. I don't know if they were just like, you know, more on top of things in the news or they had heard about it in shul or, or what, but they got very interested in it and they started to look, we were all back to Judaism at this point and they started to look into Aliyah. So my mom and my dad um, went on what's called a pilot trip, which is you come over to Israel for a week or two um, to explore Israel, to see if this is what you really want to do, where you really want to live. Mm -hmm. They decided that they did. Um, and when they got back, they talked with our rabbi, who was a Breslover, by the way, and, um, well, one of our rabbis. Anyway, he advised, so my husband had not converted yet, actually, because um, he advised my parents hold off and not make Aliyah until my husband converted. I do not know why, but that was the advice he gave. So my parents, they said they wanted to make Aliyah, but they put it off. So my husband converts to Judaism. My parents decide to go ahead with the plans. My parents make Aliyah. Next Pesach, so nine months later, my dad has a website. He has a blog on the website. And at the end of the blog, he writes, um, you know, Passover is coming up soon. And I have two daughters who live in America. And um, he said that I pray that when they sing at the end of the Passover Seder this year, next year in Jerusalem, that they really mean it. And I was like, thanks, Dad. A little bit of Jewish guilt there. Um, but then I just like totally let go of it. I didn't even think of it. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, uh, my husband and I, his commute from Baltimore to Washington actually south of Washington, was becoming longer and longer. When we first made moved to Baltimore, it was about a 45-minute trip with no traffic. Um, and it had doubled to an hour and a half, upwards closer to two hours if there was rain or if it was bad time. And one time it took him five or six hours to get home because of a snowstorm. And we decided we have got to move someplace where there's still high tech and a smaller Jewish community that's more affordable, that's closer in. And we started knocking on doors, so to speak. We started putting in applications, um, New Hampshire, and I think Minnesota was actually one of the places that we were looking into moving. And um, so we're already thinking about leaving Baltimore. My dad writes this article that says, I hope that my daughter thinks about this when she sings next year in Jerusalem at the end of the Passover Seder. So Passover comes, we're sitting at the Seder, we get to the end of the Seder, we start singing next year in Jerusalem. And I turn to my husband and I say, why are we singing this? Do we really mean it? And he looked at me and he said, well, that's a really good question. And so we decided, let's look into making Aliyah. I mean, if we're thinking about moving out of the area anyway, mm -hmm. let's look into what that means. And so we did, and we came on a pilot trip, and we decided to move to Israel. Oh, man. That's wonderful. Yeah, we were, yeah, we, were we were sort of the we same. We, we were there in 2013, and it was always, it was I love that we, it was like a fair story, story, you know? And yeah. then, um, but then we went there, and now it's real, and it, there's there's a difference. I think all Jews should go to Israel at least once to visit because it takes it from being this fantasy realm. I mean, like, who knew that when you're walking up to the, the old city, there's going to be zillions of cars shooting right by the edge of it? 
almost, you know, that, that yeah. road there that's so busy. And it mm-hmm. just, it becomes real in a way that it really wasn't before. Uh, we were hoping yeah. to move there in 2013, but financially we couldn't figure out how to do it. But, uh, yeah, but that's to be wonderful. Uh, Anita Bosch has joined us, as says Sarah Aharon. David, my dear friend, says, you might define differently except, while Rabbi Shlomo is probably more emphasizing the halakhic part, to whether the conversion is legit, while Panina probably talks about the cultural and social aspect. I'm not quite sure what that's in relation to, David. When but... you said we don't accept converts. Oh, oh, yeah. So I'm saying we do accept converts. Most Orthodox Jews practically worship converts as Jews who have gone through so much being Jews by choice. Mm-hmm. But... What I was saying, which you agreed with, is that aspect. there's a question. It's not the question isn't a halachic question once the validity of the conversion has been established. Right. The question is that with all of the charlatans and all of the people, you know, putting on a hat and saying I'm a rabbi, or or even like I do conversions also, and I had somebody give me the 10th degree. I don't do the conversions. I do the preparation. And then I set them up with a local rabbi who does the bait den and the conversion, but not everybody accepts the rabbi that I use as legitimate. And so that's where you get into, you know, maybe they're accepted into their community, but they're not accepted for Aliyah, or maybe they're accepted by one community, but not by another. And mostly it's not because they don't love converts. It's because they want to make sure that they're sincere. And this is one of the things I talk about a lot. A lot of people talk about the need for conversion reform. We need to make conversion easier. And I say, no, we don't need to make it easier. We need to make it less humiliating. Mm -hmm. And why I say that is I have seen, and I mentioned this earlier, so many people who have converted and then gone off the derech and I feel like, you know, the reason, and I explain this to a lot of my students, the reason that that conversion has to be difficult is because they have to make sure that you understand Mm -hmm. what you are actually committing yourself to when you convert, that that you will suddenly be a member of the most hated people in the world. And you may be called on to give your life for this. Are you prepared to do that? And on top of that, If you choose to walk away, you are still a Jew, which means now you have added to our collective sins Mm -hmm. by becoming a Jew. And then see, see, a non-Jew is not sinning when they eat pork, Mm -hmm. right? right? Why would you then make yourself have the status of someone who is sinning by eating pork and then go back to eating pork or... Shabbat or whatever, we could use a lot of examples, but I know a couple who was converting at the same time that my husband was going through his conversion. They thought that this couple was just so adorable and they kind of fast tracked them through the conversion and they got their conversion. I was actually heartbroken that they converted so much before my husband did. And um, then they went off and they moved out of town. And next thing you know, I'm seeing on Facebook, she's dressed in a bathing suit and he's not wearing a kippah anymore. And they're talking about things they did on Shabbat and they're talking about unkosher restaurants that they went to. And it's like, why? We right. didn't need to add to our collective sins. We already have enough people who were born into the nation that are, you know, contributing to it. Sure. So, so the, that's, that's part of it. It doesn't make it easier. Right. No, I understand I, that. I totally you know, agree with you. I would, I would I say though, that the thing, thing is not, I think it needs, it needs to be hard. hard. I totally agree with you. But I think what needs to be changed is consistency. True. That's what Very we true. need. Because now we may understand that the reason they're not accepted is because this group or that group doesn't accept the bait den they went through. All they know is I'm Jewish. I'm living as a Jew. And right. this group accepts me and this group doesn't. And that group, you know, it needs to be 100%. consistent, orthodox and non-orthodox. Everybody needs to get together and say, this is Shul Kanaruk. This is what is required. This is how you do it. You do it that way, and then everybody can accept it, and you're part of the community. That's actually what I was referring to. 
Uh, yeah. And and I I think that we're on the same page. We're yeah. just talking, as he said, about two different aspects. Yeah. Um, the point is, is that, um, you know, I agree with you 100 percent, especially within orthodoxy, because an orthodox conversion requires a bait din of three Shomer Shabbat, you know, Shomer mm -hmm. Mitzvot, those who observe fully observant men. And if there was some way of just making sure that every conversion went through a bait din that was declared kosher by somebody, I don't know who. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that we live in a very, uh, we live in a world of, um, of, not what's the opposite of clarity i just lost my words um chaos <laughs> chaos um of of you know things being covered over of right. blurriness right we, we live in what's that concealed, concealed. The, the truth is concealed a world of concealment thank you right. i just had a senior moment right. um we live in a world of concealment and everybody's walking around half blind. Right. And because of this, there's so much, as we say in Hebrew, shtiyut, which is stupidness that goes on, even in the name of Judaism, mm -hmm. that is not going to, unfortunately, be cleared up until Mashiach comes and we have clarity. Right. Um, but, you know, politics gets in the way. And we just had recently a case of, you have we there's a, a wine company in Israel called Barkan, B-A-R-K-A-N, Barkan Winery. And they had some Ethiopian Jewish workers. OK, now these are guys who are strictly observant, uh, what we call Haredi. They wear white shirts and black kippahs and black pants, and they're very, very committed to halacha. And, you know, there's a law and I don't want to get into the validity of this or how offensive it is, but there's a law in Judaism that non-Jews are not allowed to touch wine. Right. So so the Edat Haredi, which is the highest and I say highest with quotes because I don't think they're the highest, but they're considered the most strict, mm -hmm. highest cer kosher certification organization in Israel. Right. The Ethiopian men had converted through the Rabbanut. Now, the Israeli Rabbanut is known for their strictness in conversions. In fact, they're the ones who have been denying all these converts making Aliyah because they're not recognizing their conversions. OK, mm -hmm. but the Rabbanut has a political fight with the Eda HaKharedi, this Kashrut organization. So the Rabbanu, the Kashrut organization decides that they're not going to accept the conversions from the Rabbanu. So suddenly these men who are working in this winery are declared not Jewish and not allowed to be near the wine anymore. Fortunately, the chief, the Sephardi chief rabbi of Israel stood up and said, this is racist and you're not allowed to do that. And Barkan, if anybody is buying Israeli wine and you see Barkan available, buy it. Barkan said, too bad. We'll give up your certification. We'll go with a different certification. These men got their jobs back. Good. But the point that I was trying to make is that there's just so much garbage that goes right. on in politics and competition. And you don't like our thing, so we're not going to like your thing. You don't recognize our conversion, right. so we're not going to recognize yours. And, of course, the poor converts get caught in the middle. Right. That was um, my point. Yeah. But that's not... That's at a different level. Most Jewish people mm -hmm. completely, once they know that somebody's conversion is considered fine, they are besides themselves in, the, in some people, it's almost like a worship, if you will, their, of their respect for people who have chosen to become Jewish. Sure. So, you know, there is that differentiation between what happens in the acceptance of their conversion you know, versus their acceptance into the community. I mean, there are some isolated communities that like the Syrian Jewish community traditionally does not accept converts at all. They don't even have their own. They don't accept them, which is ridiculous because it completely goes against most of the writings of uh, our forefathers. Yeah. But um, but yeah, for the most part, once the, that is cleared up, then it's fine. It's like when my husband and I went to make Aliyah, so what's the first thing the Jewish agency did? They sent back a letter apparently saying, you know, who was his conversion by? We don't accept it or whatever. Now, as it turned out, 
I had some what we call protexia. And it's a Hebrew, modern Hebrew term, meaning, you know, I had people watching out for me. Mm -hmm. I had done some work very recently with the Jewish agency and helping them to keep messianics from making Aliyah. And um, so my name was known to the Jewish agency and our application came through while we were on our pilot trip in Israel. So long story short, they had written to our rabbi asking about my husband's conversion and they sent other documentation showing that his conversion was by a very respected Beit Din. It was the Star K, the, the Beit Din of Baltimore. And um, it was all taken care of before we even knew it. In fact, they had to tell us after the fact. Unfortunately, many people who convert don't have it that lucky. Right. You know, they don't have somebody on their side like we did, but even we did have that. It's just that it was taken care of very quickly. Right. Uh, Miroslav Lavabantuski has joined us, as has Jorge Rodriguez, uh, Yishka Rose. David Brown says this political infighting is the same as what destroyed the Second Temple. That 100%. 100%, David. You are totally, completely right. And my thing is, I keep thinking, I hear all of these people saying, we want Messiah now. And there's one particular group that's famous for using that as a motto. And yet... Now I should now I got to be careful because I shouldn't have made that last point. But yet people are doing this infighting, and they are just jumping over each other to see who can be the pickiest, who can be the most. I mean, it it's the politics have gone wild. Why should Messiah come? Why should Messiah be sent to this generation? Why should the temple be built in our generation if we're doing the same things that caused it to be destroyed last time? That is a really good question. And, you know, that's why they say that the Messiah will come under one of two circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. One is if we merit it, which does not look like it's happening anytime soon. And the second is if we just get to the point like we were in Egypt, where if he doesn't rescue us soon, we're going to completely destroy ourselves, which unfortunately is what it looks like is going to happen. And, you know, you're a hundred percent correct. Um, <laughs> I happen to be a person who, because I want to bring positivity into this world, um, I try to always look at things with an eye in tow, good eye. And so I can also see the fact that they are zealous for God, if you will, that they're coming just like Christians are coming from a good place, even if what they're saying is incorrect, and even if the end result of what they're doing is a bad thing, they as individuals are coming from a very good place. In the same regard, um, and please don't shoot me down for saying this, but, but even those people, like think about the story I just told you with the wine, okay? Why is the Eidat HaCharedi, why is this Kashrut organization being so picky about these men being present mm -hmm. because they care about honoring God's commandments. True. True. And even though they're taking it to an extreme that would not be pleasing to God at all, mm -hmm. we have to at least see that they really are trying to honor God's commandments. Totally agree. Totally agree. So it's a tough, tough situation. And yeah. I really feel like Mashiach is the only one who's going to be able to sort it out because we yeah. clearly cannot. Well, Rambam, Rambam says in the Mishnah Torah that one of the ways that we can identify Mashiach is that he will bring an end to all the divisions among the Jews. So obviously the divisions among the Jews are going to be existing. And we see them. And like you're saying, he's going to have to sort this stuff out. And the Rambam saw that almost a thousand years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Rebbe Nachman, one of, uh, one of the things that Rebbe Nachman said that I just still blows me away is he said in the days before Mashiach, great atheism will exist and it'll be difficult to even find a true scholar. Mm. And then I'm looking around. I'm seeing a lot of Jewish scholars, but I don't know how many are true Jewish scholars. I don't know how many, you know, I don't know. We are a very divided people. We're in trouble. Uh, we, we need Hashem's mercy because we're making some mistakes. Jorge Rodriguez has joined us. As says, I already read those. Yishka Rose. Um, David's, uh, it dropped. Okay. I just posted a link to my study 
two messiahs, which will give you more information on what Panina was talking about, Mashiach bin Yosef and Mashiach bin David. Um, Panina is making, uh, shaking her head. Why are you shaking your head? Because the concept of two messiahs, if you take it out of context, you are totally wrong. No, I know. And In the study, I don't take it out of context. I explain it. Oh, oh, oh. It's, okay. it's, it's a catchy, it's a catchy name. Ah, okay. I thought this was a comment somebody was making about two messiahs. Oh. And no, they're contemporaries and whatever. Okay, right. you know all no, of that. No, I know that. This is a study I wrote on to, ah, on, on right. Ben Yosef and Ben Yosef. Forgive ben, me. No, I no, misunderstood no. what I was hearing. Well, I thought maybe, maybe, maybe I blew it. I don't know. But that's no. a, it's a good presentation. I explained sort of the rabbinic perspective and why we believe that Ben, uh, ben, uh, ben uh, Yosef will probably come before Ben David even though it could go either way, like you said. It's just a basic presentation on that. But it's a pretty good study if people are interested in seeing that. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, but it's a catchy title, though. The way it got your attention is one reason why I named it that, yeah. because it, the, the title jumps out at you, because people, two messiahs, what are you talking about? So it well, gives people I know the where it comes from. Yeah. But they are called Mashiach bin Yosef and Mashiach bin David. Yes. Uh, David says, uh, I couldn't do it. Uh, see, David, see, David says he couldn't have joined us last week either. My friend David Deutsch. So Hashem has his reasons. We don't yep. understand them, but he has his reasons. Uh, Dennis Akola, a very good, dear Noahite friend of mine, says, <coughs> excuse me, I will follow Torah as best I can with regards for the Jews. Let Geshem, let Hashem decide um, who I am, oh, who I am loved by. So, and it, yeah, that's the attitude to have. It's like, you don't accept me or accept me. As long as Hashem accepts me, I'm a happy camper. Right. But community right. is also important. Yes. And, and that was something that when my husband and I first were coming back to Judaism that we really struggled with because we didn't necessarily buy into everything uh, in the beginning. And we were trying to figure out what our identity would actually be mm -hmm. and you know we even looked at the care rights and we looked at other things and we realized that you know we were like okay if we he and i as adults can say i'm nothing or i don't fit in any box but we had children to worry about and right. who would they marry and you know all of that so we had to make a decision which community would become ours now once we did that, we began to learn much more and truly became a part of the community that we are a part of. But um, but in the beginning, that was that was the biggest question is, is we have to decide what community we're going to be a part of because it matters more for our children right. than it does for anything else. They need an identity. Right. That's an excellent point. Excellent point. We have, I have a friend named Yael who lives uh, in Israel and one of the things that I remember her telling me, because I was asking what she thought about Breslov and what she thought about this and the non -ox and And she said, you know, what really matters is being a Jew should be enough. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason why I love our rabbi, Rabbi Yerian Nachman ben Chaim of the House of Seven Beggars, because he, he calls it, the, it's a traditional yeshiva, or uh, no, she was a traditional shul, traditional shul for everybody. A Jew is a Jew. We have we have there's too much there's too much divisiveness Sephardi or Ashkenazi or this kind of Orthodox or that kind of Orthodox or it's just it's it's just crazy. Just be a Jew if you're Jewish and if you're Noahide, just be our friend and be a good Noahide and follow the ten follow the, follow your seven laws and um, it's it's about Hashem and it's about love and it's about sharing with people and it's about being a good person and doing tikkun olam. And we just get so divided. Uh, and I really appreciate, Panina, that you're doing all this work to help bring us together and focus on what matters. And those people who are sincerely looking, that people like you are around to try to help. I really appreciate you being with us today. Um, Thank you. And you really have been a blessing. And I'm hoping that in the future uh, we can have you back again. Love to have your husband on as well. I'll talk to you off, off air about working out the circumstances on that. But okay. uh, but I really do appreciate it, and I'm sure everybody here does as well. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you again. It is you know it's very humbling having you on the show. I've enjoyed every minute of it. You truly are a blessing. In Amen. my life, you truly are. Please. I have memories of you. You will never 
We don't want to make Panina cry. Oh, oh, <laughs> I'm like, okay, guys, you know. Okay, so I, I really wasn't trying to go back to that. I, I do appreciate it, though. So, pro I, I know by the redness in her face, yes, wonderful, wonderful person, and I mean that. All right, so program notes. Uh, tomorrow, Thursday, we'll be on again at 12 noon as we'll be looking at the book Derech Hashem by the Ramchal. And then tomorrow night, we'll have our Noahide group at 8 p.m. To join that when you have to be a member of the One God, Seven Laws group. Please remember to sign up for the Noahide newsletter. Contact Veronica Port for that. Please join us at their All Heart group, which is where we're doing crafts that we're then distributing to various people. Uh, Sunday nights at 8 p.m., we have an offline on Google Hangouts group of people who get together and make things with crafts that we then later distribute to various people. Donald uh, is sort of heading up our um, our kosher cooking group. We call it kosher, K-O-O-K-I-N-G, to make it stand out from the myriad other coaching, kosher cooking groups. Join us for that. Join us for all of our broadcasts. Visit me at allfaith.com. Visit us at the House of Seven Beggars for our regular services. Thank you all so much. And uh, I truly do appreciate each and every one of you for being here with us. So, friends, until next time, my prayer is that God would bless you, keep you, and cause his face to shine evermore upon each and every one of you. God bless you. We're going to go ahead and close with the music that we opened with, which for some reason I closed. <laughs> so let's scroll back down here. Uh, the song... Whether you're Jewish or Noahide, invite you to simply take a look around you. See the world around you. What you'll find when you do that is you'll find that you've got mitzvot to do. You've got good deeds to do. You've got the opportunity to help people. So open up your eyes. Thanks for watching. Bezrat Hashem. We'll see you next time. Open up your eyes, see the beauty around you, and open up your ears, and hear nature calling you, and open up your heart, and feel the love he has for you, and open up your hand, and give to the one who needs you. Got so much to do. The day is here for you. We got needs for us to do. That's all we got to do. And if you're feeling down, don't be alarmed. Just look to the one above and ask him for his love. For the secret to success is being very strong Knowing deep down inside that you're not at all alone With infinite wisdom and open up your spirit and catch its inspiration and open up your soul to its spiritual liberation and open up yourself to the way you should be living we got so much to do here for you we got needs for us to do that's all we got to do and if you're feeling good don't change your mood just look to the one above thank you for his love
secret to success is being very strong and knowing deep down inside he's helped you all along and thank you friends We'll see you next time. God bless.